academic and it's theater and the place where they both meet. We have the audience and participants for each other. I showed the video two times before, yeah, yeah, right? Two times? This starts out a little thing, you like a day, you have to be completely open. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, I've already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on that. Welcome everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and it's uh, our great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome you to our first day of the Penville Voices Festival. It's the significant festival um, for the Americas, maybe the largest uh, ones. I think about 60 or 70 writers from all around the world are being hosted by Penn. It's a great organization. If there's any organization to support next to Greenpeace and others, it's really Penn. Um, they support Freedom for Right to write uh, programs, got a lot of people out of prison and also really uh, champion writers, <coughs> translations and give out one of the most significant awards uh, for, for, for novelists and poets and, and other writers. So it's a great privilege for us to be part of it. The festival was founded by Salman Rushdie and Paul Oster under the first uh, Bush government when they felt America had a tunnel vision, was not listening to voices from outside the world and they thought that was bad enough then. And, um, <laughs> and uh, the statistics says that 95% of all books published in America are American or British books. The remaining 5%, half of it is French or German because the government supported it. So you have about two books out of 100 uh, from around the world. It would be unthinkable for musicians who believe in world music. They listen to music from everywhere, still practice locally, but uh, they know how significant it is to be open to voices and sounds from from around the planet to understand better who we are, where we come from, and when we are, where we are going to. Uh, I am Frank Henschker, and I'm the director of the Siegel Center. We bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. We publish here, we have international visiting scholars, and do many other things, and hopefully you will join us for our other programs. But this is at, right at the heart of what we do, so it's a very, very big moment for us in this season, and thank you for taking time out. As I said earlier, we need really good theater, but we also need a good audience, an interested audience, and formed audience, so this is fantastic for you taking time on a most probably sunny day now, finally, outside, which is very, <laughs> um, very, very uh, uh, rare. The play reading we're going to hear now, the performance will be about uh, 60 minutes, and it is uh, our great uh, pleasure to have Mikaela Dragan with us. She actually will perform herself. She's a Romanian Roma actress who lives in Berlin, works at the Great Gorky Theater. She wrote uh, monologues about uh, uh, women uh, from her, uh, from her um, family or from her friends of what she observes, and uh, it's the first time she does it in English. She also learned it to do it here. We have a great musician, a great director who put it together, a film director. So um, thank you very much. And now it's the time, I'll do this thing, get out your cell phone and let's make sure it's off. And I'll have it here, it should be sound off, mute or whatever it says. It never rings in our performances. Only one time when I showed it, I accidentally switched it on. And then of course it <laughs> rang in my discussion. So, so thank you very, very much for coming. And um, here we go, thank you. Good evening. Mishto Avilen. Hello. Hello. Mihaela Dragan, Saimesem Rumi. Which translates to I'm Mihaela Dragan and I'm Roma. Gypsy, that is. Well, actually, half. I'm half gypsy, the good half. 
yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I say to annoy the alt-right supporters. <laughs> that maybe they are in the audience tonight. Oh my God, I hope not. <laughs> anyway, the other half, hmm. nothing special. Do you wanna hear it? Yeah. I'm Romanian, and no, Roma and Romanian are not the same things. It's just a coincidence of names. Or actually, could be God's way to piss off the Romanians. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm not here to upset you with any political crap or uh, talking about uh, taking away your guns. No, no, no. <laughs> I think we will simply get along better if I share with you a personal love story. And trust me, you want to hear this. Ready? So, last year, I was at this Romanian music festival near my village, and there were all of these musicians from all over Europe who played all sorts of gypsy music, like gypsy electro, gypsy punk, gypsy ska, gypsy hip hop. And when they heard that I'm a gypsy, oh boy, <laughs> the look in their eyes, they were fascinated. Are you a real gypsy? Wow, so cool. A real one? Yeah. <laughs> they were all, how do you Americans say? Uh, freak out? Yes, <laughs> this is the word. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure you can guess what happened. At least three of those musicians fell in love with me. I'm serious, don't be so surprised. <laughs> One of them even asked me to marry him. Really? He said, all my life I've been waiting for a woman like you, Mikalana. <laughs> he couldn't pronounce my name right. Okay, perhaps that should have been the first warning. Anyway, he said, I am a gazo. That's what we call a non-Roma person. But don't worry, this will come up later. And he was like, I know everything there is to know about Roma people. You see, Mikalana, I've been playing gypsy music for over 10 years, and I love gypsy music. Wow. <laughs> I have to admit, this impressed me. 10 years playing gypsy music? Wow. So I decided to sing a song for him. conquer his heart with that one. <laughs> Before he left the country, he let me his CD signed. The best two days of my life, big kiss for my future wife. The romantic in me gave him a hair strand, along with my grandpa's gypsy song notebooks. 
he's a musician after all. And I also gave him, him one of the earrings I was wearing and I said, I will keep one earring and you keep one till we see each other again. I will only feel whole again when both pieces are reunited. <laughs> it took three and a half months of talking on Facebook for him to finally ask me, wouldn't you like to come to Netherlands to stay here a few days with me? <coughs> well, <laughs> that's all I needed to hear. So I borrowed some money and I got a plane ticket right away. I kept thinking, I have at last found my prince who will marry me and finally take me away from this country. I was so excited that one week before I left, I couldn't sleep or eat because he was all I could think about. And then, the day of my departure. I came down with major stomach cramps. Could you believe? I guess because of all the excitement. So here I am, the princess who was waiting for the moment we, we would finally make love. And it was finally going to happen and I won't be able to get off the freaking toilet. Oh my God, why is so karma so bad? But I was not going to lose this opportunity. So I desperately popped some pills just so I could feel a little better. Because, you know, I really had to be the woman he'd been waiting for all of his life. Not some dirty gypsy. Lucky for me, or should I say for him, the pills held back the, you know what. <laughs> Thankfully the pills worked so well that I decided to wear a sexy garter belt and a mini skirt, but I was so wrapped up in the excitement and I was so happy that the cramps went away that I forgot it was the middle of January <laughs> in the Netherlands. So, I arrived. Oh my God, the wind was blowing up my little dress. And here I am with my tiny stockings trying my best to be sexy. <laughs> so what? I thought, I am on a mission. I have to conquer him as soon as he sees me. You know what they say, first impression matters, right? And then, I see him, oh my God, my knees were trembling and not because of the cold. <laughs> you look great, he says, yes, yes, I gloat. And then we kiss, it was perfect. And after we go to his place, mm, kind of messy. Come on, Mihaela, that's how bachelors live. I said to myself, we tour around the house and on the floor, I see some kind of plants left to dry on some newspaper sheets. You know, just like the ones my grandma used to pick to make tea. And after she picked the chamomile, she left it to dry. You know what this is? He asked me. Tea? <laughs> marijuana. Whoa, you can make marijuana tea? <laughs> I, I brought some souvenirs from you after the show. <laughs> they are here <laughs> from Netherlands. <laughs> anyway, then I realized what was going on here. How can I be so stupid? The man of my dreams was a marijuana tea dealer. Very innovative. But still, this is very bad. No, no, this is really bad, very bad. But wait, I know this must be why I came into his life. Don't you see? to save him. <laughs> it all makes sense now. For 20 years, he'd been smoking marijuana tea. And God brought me into his life so that I would help him smoking or drinking, whatever. Yeah, that's it. I was so sure of it. I was feeling so sure of my mission. You know, I felt like some, some kind of uh, heroine for him. Some sort of Nancy Reagan. Do you remember? <laughs> Just say no. Yeah. Okay, okay, I said to myself, I'm up for my purpose. I mean, how hard can it be to stop a musician from recreational drugs? <laughs> <laughs> so, two days go by and 
I was so stoned as well that I couldn't remember my mission so well. <laughs> Moreover, it seemed like all of his friends were stoned all the time as well. So God couldn't expect me to stop all of them, right? And trust me, he had a lot of friends. And they all knew me as the Romanian gypsy girl that Gregor met at his concert in Romania. They were all so curious to hear things about my enchanting gypsy world. I felt like I was a museum piece. <laughs> I don't, you see, in Romania, no one would give me the time of day for being gypsy. And these people would pay just to talk to me for 10 minutes. <laughs> I have to admit that I like the situation. <laughs> yeah. For the first time, I was the exotic one. It was like my human value was higher just because I was born a gypsy. I mean, yeah, it was still discrimination, but positive this time, if that's a thing. <laughs> well, what can I say? After a few days of being the interesting gypsy, I was getting a little tired of having the same conversation with everyone. So I added a little drama, just a little, <laughs> to my life story. So I told them how my Romanian father had stolen my gypsy mother from the ghetto. And there was a big war between gypsies and Romanians. And my mom, my mom showed some sort of gypsy Juliet because she wanted to kill herself out of love for my dad. But she was forbidden to marry him because he was, he, he was a gajo. But dad didn't care he was a gajo. As a matter of fact, for most of his life, he was not aware he was a gajo. <laughs> Just like many of you here this evening. <laughs> Have you ever thought that we call you gaje? Hello, gaje. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, I invented a Romeo and Gypsy Juliet story for my parents. Although, well, my parents didn't love each other so much. And they have been divorced for about 15 years. Also, my Roma family hasn't been living in a ghetto. But, you know, I wanted to keep the romanticism alive. In my defense, these people were artists and they were not interested in details like crafts or pots, you understand? <laughs> I mean, it's like, Fox News here in the US. It's not lying, it's entertainment, <laughs> no? So thinking back, we did have a lot of fun. Gregor was taking me from bar to bar, smoking and drinking every night. I guess I didn't say no. I'm sorry, Nancy. So I remember the first time I saw him naked I stared at him for about two minutes. No, it wasn't that. What do you think about you? <laughs> His body was all covered in tattoos. I mean, they were everywhere, even in places they should not be. He had a big tattoo on his belly saying, rude boy. His stage name, Gregor Terror. Were not there enough clues for me? As for our moment of love, when I finally did it, oh my God, I'm ashamed to say it. But I will say it like this. <laughs> Turns out I waited for three and a half months for three and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Soon after those three minutes, I asked him about my earring. He said he no longer had it. Could you believe? I was so disappointed in myself. Not only had I failed to be the heroine of his life, the good girl that would save rude boy from perdition, but I ended up just being like him. I remember once when we sat down to eat, he would read the newspaper. I shouted at him asking for the knife about 10 times. Gregor, Gregor, louder and louder. He would hear me, but he wouldn't listen. I was just invisible for him. He finally answered, what? <clears throat> you know, it's not okay to read a newspaper while you eat because we need to show respect for the meat. And I was asking for the knife, that's all. 
you ask for the knife. In English, it's knife. If you say knife, everybody's going to laugh at you. And anyways, who are you? Virgin Mary in my house to tell me what's right and wrong? I always read the newspaper when I eat, and that's how I like it, okay? I was numb, I swear. I burst into tears, and with my shitty English and all, I said, listen there, your motherfucker. <laughs> Hasn't anyone loved you enough in this life to show you how it feels like to care for anyone else but yourself? Needless to say, I returned back to Romania after all this adventure, depressed. This guy wasn't anything I imagined him to be. So I thought, would I be bothered with this idiot if I was a traditional gypsy? Hmm? I would have married a virgin at 15 and actually maybe would have been better off. This is actually what I wanted to talk about in this play, about Roma women who married traditionally. And you know what? After all this hassle with Mr. Terror, I'm not so sure it's so bad to marry age 15. If the groom is a good guy, you know? I was thinking for a long time about producing a play about Roma women. So, FYI. Even if I will portray stories of Roma women who had struggles going to school, I want you to know that there are plenty of Roma women with an education. And the idea of an educated Roma is a big stereotype about us. So let's start. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you my first Roma woman, Maria. Someone, no, no, not yet. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Someone told me about, about a gypsy Maria who married virgin. And I called her one day and I told her what it was about and she agreed meeting me in the park. Hello, Maria. Wait a second. How do I recognize you? Oh, don't worry. You'll have no problem recognizing me. I'm black and fat. Bad, but beautiful, said her husband's voice in the background. All right, all right, and me, you know, I'm black and short. So see you at the entrance. I waited for her in the park with my ex-boyfriend, Rezvan, who was helping me film her story. Out of habit, we were holding hands. When he left for a moment, she said, why are you involved with a Romanian? You couldn't find a Roma like you? At least he wouldn't call you gypsy when you fight. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, Maria, I mean, how could he call me a gypsy if he was a gypsy too, right? I laughed. But actually, Rezvan used to call me gypsy. How is my gypsy? Come over, gypsy. When we returned from the park after meeting Maria, I told him, dude, I don't want to encourage the use of the word gypsy. You know well it's used pejoratively and shows lack of respect. In our Romani language, the word doesn't even exist. So, since now, please use Roma instead of Gypsy. Okay, Gypsy, he laughed. And how would you like me to call you? My Roma, the capital of Italy? No, just my Roma. Finally, about Maria. She laughed all the time while telling the story of her life. Her marriage with Sergio, a Roma like her, Maria. Thank <laughs> you. 
When he first met my parents, he came bearing gifts, which I thought it was very special. My father didn't think so. He was like, oh, what is the big deal he brings gifts? After all, it's Christmas Day. Yes, he came to my house on Christmas. But actually, we met the three months earlier, on 9-11 to be exact, you know, the day the towers fell in New York. Back then, I was somewhat of a journalist, and I was at a conference about Roma poverty that was being held at Four Seasons Hotel. I met Sergio there, he's an activist for Roma rights, and we were engaged like everybody for three months, and after that, we got married, like everybody, right? <laughs> So I presented him to my family as my boyfriend, and I told them that we wanted to get married. We were so sure that we found each other, and that we were made for each other, that we decided to get married. My parents were very excited, especially my mother. Poor her, <laughs> because she thought nobody would marry me, because I skipped all the marrying ages in my community. There was no unmarried boy of my age, 27, even if I would have searched. Oh my God, I remember. I had to marry a 16-year-old boy. And for him, it seemed very normal to marry me if my parents would agree, because they are used to making this step as soon as they choose a girl and they can provide for her. Poor him, at 16, totally immature, I told him I'm 10 years older than him, but for him it didn't matter. He wanted me to be his wife. When I heard him, I started laughing really hard. The poor guy, he was really serious. Anyways, my marriage with Sergio. Yeah, I recall my father telling my mother to ask me if I respect my mother-in-law's house. Well. He didn't have the courage to ask me himself if, you know, if I'm still a virgin. So, does she respect the house of her future husband or not? <laughs> so my mother come and ask me half mouthed. I said, yes, I'm a virgin. She was relieved, my poor mother. <laughs> so that's it, we got married the next month. All of my folks came and his folks came and it was a very simple wedding, nothing traditional, except for the fact that everybody was a Roma. We had a really great time, but as I said, there was nothing traditional, excepting my virginity at 27 years old. Actually, no, this wasn't so common. So, as I said, I was also history teacher for Roma classes and my students from seventh grade I had 30 of them in my class. I remember that I tried to tell and to convince them that it's important to continue going to school. And I thought I could be an example. Because look, I went through school and in one break the girls came to me and told me, Miss, but our mother said you are old and you are still not married. You don't have a family. I was 25 and I was old. Can you imagine an old lady? And then I realized, yes, I wasn't really a role model for them because they were 13, 14, and that's what they wanted, to have a family. And I was 25 and I still didn't have one. And for them it was shocking. I was amazed that they were not interested in a career. And to my great amazement, they were extremely ready to be mothers and wives because they were raised and formed like this. They knew how to make bread, to paint walls, to raise a child. They are not unhappy because they didn't see how cool it can be to be a career woman. They didn't care about this. Still, there was a small amount of girls from traditional family that wanted in school. And there was this girl, her name was Somnia. You know, she made it all the way up to 90 degree. And when she was forced to marry, she didn't feel comfortable with the situation at all. I am the school, she wrote on the wall before she hanged herself. Yeah, because 
she started to have other options than the ones that were available in her community. Because in a community, when everybody lives the same and you copy their lifestyle, you don't have any reasons to be unhappy. You live the way you see. Maria's last words were deeply engraved in my mind. You live the way you see. I also learned a lot from Maria about the many marriage rituals of traditional Roma people, especially the virginity ceremony. They say this is the most important of them all. But I find it frightful that on your wedding night, at midnight, you have to go with your husband to bed while everybody knows where you are going and what's about to happen. And there, in no less than 10 old ladies at the window of the bedroom, watching over, you know what. The point is that these old women will give their word that it happened with honor. But I ask myself, how, how can you, well, how can you make love with 10 old ladies at the window watching? <laughs> I imagine them. Come on, do it. Do it already, you can. Come on, we've been sitting here for an hour. Yeah, 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 I think this is the direction. Good, good, good. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> and after it's done, they go out to the party dancing with the girl's blood-stained nightgown on a plate on which they also throw money. The, their word that everything happened with honor. After I found this out from Maria, I asked myself, is early marriage a Roma tradition that defines us? Or just a practice from the times of Roma slavery, when the owners had sexual privileges on their virgin slaves. The parents wanted at the beginning to protect the girls and marry them as soon as possible before the owners could rape them. Even at the age of 12 or 13. Still, I wonder why nowadays some stubborn traditional Roma want to maintain this practice. Since the world was made, since then, we thought, who knows and understands where love comes from? From the eyes, from the eyebrows, there will be no more great sins. From the lips, from the eyes, with a look and a desire, from my eyes and my heart, with passion to have me in my eyes and my heart. Do I want to be your wife?
Once upon a time, there was an incredible true story. The adulteress, as I call it. And it goes like this. There once was a Roma king who had a son who married the most beautiful Roma girl anyone had ever seen. However, she was from another Roma group. She even had attended school. She made it to the eighth grade before she married. And you see, the community she entered into look at her suspiciously. They were afraid that the school had a bad influence on her. But despite people's suspicions, the beautiful girl was married being virgin. Chai Bari, how we Roma say. And it was a very happy marriage. They even had two children. The beautiful girl had big and progressive dreams. She dreamed to build a gypsy fashion house one day. She would talk about it all the time, even though most of the Roma consider that dreams are just for gaje. But she kept her dream. And would you believe that she became famous? She once gave an interview for a famous uh, fashion magazine. I forgot the name. Anyway. And then, on the day her husband was turning 30, the whole community was celebrating him in front of the palace with fireworks and huge rocket-sized firecrackers. It was going to be a great party. Three of the firecrackers were successfully launched in the honor of the Roma king's son. It was an amazing sight. But the four had trouble to launch. So the son of the Roma leader had bent over it to see what's wrong. And at that exact moment, the firecracker blew. He had half of his head removed. The witnesses said, this tragedy was seen as a curse. The whole family was in enormous pain. And the beautiful girl, the wife, was widow so young with two small children to raise. In fact, the family was in such pain that they even wanted to bring their son's body in the house. And this is something that is not allowed in almost all Roma communities. Because the dead person is kept outside, is considered to be a cursed passing, a bad luck bearer. Bibacht, we say in Romani language. So the community was opposed to this, and his body was left outside in a tent. It was winter. It was heartbreaking how the mourners were crying.
Soon after the funeral, people started to talk that the beautiful wife had betrayed his husband before his death and that she was having a relationship with another man. Well, a Roma widow with children who is living with her in laws is not allowed to remarry and start a new family. And it was said and decided that the affair had started way before her husband's death. So naturally, she was banished from the community. And she was sent to her parents without her children. After a while, I found out some awful news from the widow's father. He told me that she died only a few years after she went back home to her parents. The rumor has it, one day she got sick and went outside and right there she had a heart attack. She died when she was only 30 years old and unbelievable, the same age as her husband. Her father was so hard that he kept saying only nice things about her. It may have been only a friendly relationship with the rumor man he would shot. But no matter, the traditional culture punish hard in order to keep their balance. Kina tu menge mireazva. Kuda lenge kai chijan ente roven. I sell you my tears to those who don't know how to cry. Nu maso de te manga ulendar, te na vela olovola milako. But I don't know how much to ask, because I don't want any pity. Da te si vare kon, so semles ke drago. But if someone cares for me. Nabikinao, daulen leske. I won't sell him my tears. They will be my gift. So si as vale kami maske. Because they are love tears. <sighs> Tell me what you want me to start. I can start by showing you things from my closet. But drink your coffee first. Drink it. Mm. Very good. It has been made from a secret recipe from my mother, Bobo Chica. Don't worry, it will not affect your heart. And anyways, I have to throw away the cups you have been drinking from. That's the tradition. Please understand, you are not our people, so you have a different ethnicity. You are tainted, I'm sorry to tell you. Because you don't live by our purity rules. Yeah. Yes, sure, I'm ready. Sorry, but in what magazine will be this published? How? Vogue. I've never heard about it. 
But doesn't matter. I return to my husband to buy it for me. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, ask me. Of course there is a gypsy fashion, but it's not the one you hear about on TV. People are not interested to find our ways and traditions, to find out the truth. Where have you seen oversized crinoline skirts? No way! If you see gypsy fashion. Where? There where is our braided hair? Where are the scarves? Or our underscarts? Of course you don't dress without your underscart lady. I also like to wear Spanish-like skirts, but after 30, 32, it doesn't work anymore. I'm forced to wear an apron and usual skirts without layers upon layers. After the age of 30, the colors have to be more faded, but still beautiful. <laughs> the darkest color you can choose is dark blue. Black, black, no, not black. Not black because it's for mourning the dead. No. Of course there are, of course there are young girls who choose simpler and shorter skirts. But we don't mix our fashion with their or with, the, or with those flowers selling gypsies. We also don't have things in common with women from other Roma communities. The fashion is different. Each one with her people, with her traditions. But after a certain age, everybody has to wear an apron. And you know what? When you wash the skirts, you place them in a different pot. The things we wear below the waist, like the skirts, men's trousers, and the underwear, are not mixed with the shirts or towels. Otherwise, it's a disaster. Listen to me, they become cursed. <laughs> men's fashion. Men's fashion is passing faster without much fuss. But when it comes to women, not everybody can start the process of change. But we can't adopt any fashion we want, even if we like it. For example, I can't wear a dress because people will say that is cursed and they will ask me, where do you wash it? Do you pull it over your head? You never pull the skirt over your head. It's a shame to pull over a piece of cloth which you wear below your waist. Big shame. <laughs> We never use dresses, just skirts and tops, in order to separate the top that is poor from the bottom that is impure. Men are allowed to wear anything, the same as Romanians. But we women, we are forced to follow the traditions, even when they are outside the community. If that's the tradition, that's it, we have to keep it. For example, one evening about three years ago, my husband and his cousin got this idea to go to seaside. And we packed our bags, stuffed the car with bed sheets, got the kids, got the cousin and his wife, everybody in the same car, and we left. We arrived there around 4 a.m. We were dressed as gypsies, of course. The man said to us, God, I won't go with you like, uh, like that. How will, you, how will we enter the hotel by your side when you are wearing those gypsy clothes. And he was right. They were modern, the kids were dressed by the latest fashion, and we had our hair braided and headscarves. But just a moment. I unbraided my, my hair, I stuffed the scarves under the car pillows, and I entered the hotel. At the reception, they could tell that they were gypsies. Even if I had my hair on my shoulders, they told us that the only available room is on the 13th floor, the last one. We all asked for one room, that's how we are used all together. We changed the hotel sheet with ours. Why? Because we don't sleep where others have slept, even if the sheets are washed. No, 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 we changed them, and just after that we slept. The next day, when the cleaning lady came, she saw the sheets folded and she didn't understand anything. I explained to her, lady, we are gypsies. Yeah, we tell the truth as it is. What? No, 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 no lady, listen to me. It's not that we want to separate ourselves from the gadget through our traditions. Well, let me give you an example. I jumped from an idea to another. I came here from a different community, from a village where I've lived mostly with gadget. And in our community, the first house was made by my grandfather. 
when he came back from the Transnistria camps? No, the Roma genocide. So I went to school. I went to school and only after that I married. And now, when the time has come for my daughter to go to kindergarten, people started to talk. They were saying that I will spoil her if I send her to school with the Gage boys. I stood up for myself. So what? It's not like I didn't go to school where Romanians did, and I still ended up marrying a Roma. So I was followed by some women. They sent her kids to kindergarten too. But after, they started to say, if we are so many, why wouldn't they separate our kids from the Gaje? But won't they spend all their lives in a Gaje world anyway? And after that, they settled down. So to get back to what I was saying, when we went to the sea, the people from the village were gossiping that we will forget about our traditions and will undress in front of each other. I'm only allowed to do that in front of my husband. So it didn't happen like that. Men bathe in the sea, but not for long because the water was cold. But me, I stayed on the sand being dressed the whole time. The men were laughing at me and Veta, but they didn't force us. They knew what the tradition is. But people around us were looking, making signs. We're looking strange dressed on the beach. Even if we wanted to look different than usual, that wasn't possible. Our men were telling us, look, you are not supposed to talk in our language around here. But it was difficult. I can't talk in Romanian when I'm among my people. It just doesn't come natural, you know? Yeah, well, even if we had money, we were hiding that we are Roma because we were, we were humiliated and it was hard to find a way out. But the most problems we have is with the police. But I'm not afraid. If a policeman comes into my father-in-law's courtyard to ask questions, I understand his intention. And I ask him, do you have a warrant? If not, I'm going to call all the media on your head. He asks for my ID card and then I say, I'm Kalofira Pita the daughter-in-law of the gypsy leader. And I'm his right hand, and when he, when he is not here, I'm in charge of all the responsibilities. Do you have any study? <coughs> he asks. And I say, yes. I might have studied more than other people around here. And he, if he sees that I'm standing my ground, he simply goes away, knowing that there is nothing that he can do to me. He knows that, and he knows that I know that. Te avelti li pupluk hi kalofire. Tu savi ingerdian, yeh chivi pen, zvuntovi uzo. May you rest in peace, dear Kalofira. You who lived a life simple and pure. We would like to dedicate a song to Kalofira, who was called the adulteress, and to her husband.
biggest surprise in my research for my play was the last girl I met, Roxana. A really rebellious Romani. So naturally, I call her the Joan of Arc of the Gypsies. After I had already put together most of my material for my play, I began to have doubts that my subjects would be of any interest. I myself, I was feeling as if I was losing my focus and most of all my purpose. I thought, who cares about Roma women anyway? But then I found Roxana, who simply struck me with the light of her being. She had been through so many things but she was a fighter. So much so she made me feel ashamed of every moment of my life when I lacked courage. So, ladies and gentlemen, the last story, Roxana. <laughs> In order to not get married at 15, I had to change my religion and became a born again Christian. My parents were telling me that is the time that all the girls get married at my age. They will think I lost my mind, that I must have my own family. But I don't care, I'm your child, you must put up with me. To which they replied, Okay, no problem. First we kill you, and after we'll throw you out of the house. And they would laugh after. When I had my period for the first time, I was so angry that I cried the whole day because I knew that from then on, I was Chai Bari, a grown-up girl and that they would expect me to get married. This is the sign. If a girl is physically prepared to have children, this means that is the time for her to get married. But I didn't feel ready at 13 to become a wife and a mother, so I refused to tell them. For one year and four months, I managed to keep my secret until the lady at the store turned me into my mother that I bought tampons. And all of this just because I didn't have paper money to give her. She said, did you steal from the collection plate at the church, you gypsy? And now you are giving all this change? I lost my temper and I said, the money is not from the church, gaji woman. But since you are not so saintly yourself, how could you know? And so, the day when my mother found out, all the family learned my secret. They thought I was cursed or that someone put bad spells on me and that was the reason why I didn't have my period and I was not becoming a woman. Well, let me tell you, for a year, all the women in my family were driving me nuts with all sorts of healing spells and liquors and potions that I had to drink and rub my body with. And all of that so I could become a woman and get married. I have an aunt, and 10 years ago when she got cancer, she became Pentecostal. And every Saturday, she would take me to the gathering with her. And that's when I first heard that if you want to remain Pentecostal, you have to marry a Pentecostal too. And at once I got this idea. There wasn't any Pentecostal boy in any of the families my father would have married me too. So I thought, if I become a Pentecostal, my chances to get married would be 
Zero. I was so desperate that this seemed to be the only solution. Now, of course, I'm ashamed that I could think something like that. Because soon I started going more often to the church, I felt like this is my place. That's where I have to be. That's where I found myself. But you know, after that, the struggle with my family didn't end. It became even harder, harder. It was a shock for them. Every time a boy came to ask for my hand, for days and days, I would fight with my family. And I would be praying, please God, please don't leave me because if you do this, I will die. And I was telling other Pentecostal, please pray for me because I don't know what more to do, how to convince them to leave me alone. And God helped me after all. Look, I'm 25 and I managed to remain unmarried. <laughs> Looking back, I thought many times that I would leave my family, that I would have liked to be born somewhere else. Why God? Why, why was I born here? Why not somewhere else? Why not in any other family? Why in this group of Roma? Why do I have to dress only traditionally? Why without school? The fact that they stopped me from going to school brought me a lot of suffering. The kids saw me and asked, Roxana, but why don't you come to school anymore? It was always hard to tell them that my parents didn't let me. Well, I just can't, I would say. I remember one day, I was at the market with my mother and we met my French teacher. And the teacher started to cry. Madame, please let her go to school because now is the best age for her to learn. My mother was impressed. Wow, a teacher crying for a Roma child? I've never seen such a thing. But her impression passed quickly. The men were already looking strangely at me because I wasn't like, like the other girls. When they thought about what they thought about the schoolgirl was, who knows what idea she might come up with from the school. Maybe she'll fall in love with a guy, she'll run away with him and then we'll never find her. My dad used to tell me, look what people say, they are spreading rumors about you. You know, for many years, being a Roma was a problem for me. It seemed to me that I was thinking like a Gaji girl, and I didn't know what was happening to me. But since I've been working in a project as an educational assistant for Roma children, I've started to see things differently. I help the kids with their homework. We went to museum, we watch movies, we analyze them. And yeah, I realized that not everyone affords education, that they are segregated in the school. There was a case that struck me so deeply. One day I got to a class where two of the children were Roma and the mother of one of them just arrived at the school to ask the teacher to move her child from the last desk near the window. This is usually the place for misbehaved, not to mention that the near of the window in Romania is absolutely freezing even in the summer. And the child just left the hospital and the mother wanted to make sure that one gets a cold again. And the teacher, she answered that, yeah, she will try. But after the mother left, she turned to me and said, I won't move him anywhere. Gypsies are used with difficult conditions. They won't die because of a cold. I don't know why, but I wasn't able to tell him that I'm also Roma. And I left asking myself, what made that teacher believe that we Roma, we don't suffer like the rest of the people? From then on, I began to accept myself as who I was and to tell it to others. Yes, I'm a gypsy and I'm proud of it. My people are here for centuries. You enslaved us for five centuries. You killed us in the Holocaust. And now you don't want to interact with us?
Sorry, what time is, Mihaela? The thing is that it's getting late and I have to go back to the church. Well, I don't know what to say, just that I wish you good luck with your play and I hope to see you again. Goodbye, Roxana. I promise you that I will produce this play. Because Roxana's message has to get across. Because she had the courage to resist tradition, to revolt against the whole system. Because she has to hide that she's going to school. And because another Roma girl hanged herself in order to not get married, and before she wrote on the wall, I am the school. Because perhaps the Roma kid near of the window is still there. And because there is still a lot of hate against my own people in the world. And because I have Romanian, half Roma, the good half, I try to make peace inside of me and outside of me. All right, so uh, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight for this beautiful performance of Mihaela Dragans del Duma. Uh, a very time, timely play, I would say, which uh, speaks um, in many interesting ways to, to the theme, the general theme of uh, this year's PEN Festival, which is Reimagine and Resist. And um, we'll have a brief panel discussion uh, about such acts of resistance and reimagining with reference to Roma theater and Roma art. Um, my name is Diana Bene, I'm a, a, a Fulbright uh, scholar this year at CUNY and I'm also an assistant professor of American Studies um, at the University of Bucharest in Romania. And I'm very honored and very excited to introduce uh, the panelists, uh, Mihaela Dragan, who you just uh, saw, actress and playwright and activist. <laughs> Thank you 
for um, coming all the way from Romania via Berlin, I think, <laughs> right? Yes, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and filmmaker uh, George Eli, uh, who directed um, this piece, as well as uh, musician and uh, musicologist Petra Gelbert, who offered uh, beautiful live music. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Mihaela, if you need the mic. Okay. <laughs> she already had the... So, um, Mihaela, I was wondering uh, if you can tell us uh, a little bit about the play, what made you want to write this play. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first play to address this topic of early marriage in, uh, in yeah, the Roma actually it was, it was the first play that I, I wrote. It was like six years ago. And um, now when I'm looking back, <laughs> I find it very differently. Yeah, it was, it was like this. I saw Roxana, the, the last character, in a documentary film about early marriage, and I was very impressed by the things that they said, she said. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm a Roma for an, from an untraditional uh, family, so this topic, it was very away for me. But uh, uh, what Roxana said in documentary really impressed me and I wanted to get to know her and to get to know Roma women who are living in a traditional families and they are dealing with early marriage. So I met Roxana and after I wanted to, I wanted to produce this play, I was like, I have to do this theater play. It was for first time when I approached this topic uh, and, the, and my identity in, in a theater play. So for me it was like, uh, it was very important for me because it was like for the first time speaking about my identity in a theater play on the stage. And uh, I felt that it was also like a coming out. <laughs> and, um, but in the end, after I met all the girls and all the women that I spoke with them, it was like, it was not anymore about me or about my, my life or my uh, career or my, it was just that I felt that these women voices uh, have to be heard. So it wasn't anymore, um, you know my thing, like an actress. So yeah, it was a documentary theater play. So I wanted, uh, I just wanted to have the voice of the women in this uh, theater play. And um, now I'm doing. I mean, this is. I mean, when I'm looking back, I mean, it's very funny for me because I will not do. I mean, I'm. Docu I mean, documentary theater is the only theater, documentary theater that I did, and I'm not anymore into this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, because uh, because I came here in the U.S. where Roma community is almost invisible, I said, okay, I have to show Del Duma because it really give you an introduction into who are Roma people. And um, yeah, maybe if I will show something more complicated like Gajo Dildo, another theater play that I did after, Maybe it will be difficult for the for the audience to get it, S and uh, and because also it was very important uh, f for me this theater play. As I said, it was like a coming out for me, and I say, okay, I have to say goodbye to Del Duma in this way, going to a festival in New York, <laughs> because I don't think I will perform it anymore. I was performing so many times during these years, and uh, in many festivals and abroad, and. Um, I, I decided, like, okay, I'm going to New York and I will say goodbye to them. <laughs> All right, since you mentioned uh, the many places where you performed this play uh, for the past five years, um, I was wondering about the reception of the play um, in different communities, with different audiences. Um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I played even in the Roma communities, in villages, in courtyards. And uh, I was really afraid how about their reactions because I don't want to go there and to say, okay, I come, I mean, I'm, I'm from a traditional Roma family. I don't want to come here and to tell you you should stop early marriage or giving you lessons. I mean, no, I don't want to do this. I mean, I recognize my privilege and no, totally. 
And I mean, actually, this is what I wanted to do, just to raise some questions and not to be in the positions to, to give lessons. And actually, it was very interesting because many times in to the Roma communities, I received such a good reactions and the people, I used to have a discussion with the people after every show and they even started to have polemics. It was like between the generation, the, the young the young ones started to argue with the old ones to say, okay, we, we have to stop doing this. I don't want my daughter to be married. I want to go to, go to high school and yeah. So it was very interesting. <laughs> different, different reactions, right? Um, you also founded a Roma feminist theater company, um, which is based in Bucharest and which is called Juvli Pen, um, which is the only Roma theater company in, um, in Romania and one of the very few in, uh, in Europe. Um, and this is a company, and I'm quoting from your manifesto, with about and for Roma women. So your goal is actually to, to serve as a platform of empowerment and visibility for such um, for issues affecting um, Roma women, right? Yeah, it was it was like this. After Del Duma, I really thought, okay, I mean, this was the only play where I approached um, the, this topic of my identity. But after Del Duma, I felt that there is a need uh, for our voices. And I, I mean, I have to f define myself as uh, Roma and I mean, the fact that we are so few, I mean, the, the fact that we don't have a theater in Romania or in Europe are so few uh, companies is like, we, we are marginalized. So there is a need for a theater Roma company because there are Roma actors and we need a space to reclaim it with our voices and with our bodies and to, to tell to people the things that, uh, Oh, because I don't know, I mean, we are from centuries, for example, in Romania, and yeah, I mean, the people, they don't even know that there was Roma slavery for five centuries. So we have to increase awareness. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, after the Duma, I just gathered this bench of uh, Roma actresses, and we created Juvli Pen. Juvli Pen, this is... Uh, translates to uh, in, uh, in feminism. Feminism, not feminine, is a difference. <laughs> Actually, we invented the word because before we hadn't in Romani language, so we had it to invent it. So Julie Pen is feminism. Julie is, uh, Julie Julie is feminine. Fem feminine is woman. Yeah. Woman. Yeah, woman. woman. Well, for me, is woman. Whatever. <laughs> in our dialect, Julie is woman. <laughs> it can be both. It's, it's the feminine. Yeah. Yeah, Georgi is a native Romani speaker, so he knows better than me. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, and after that we started to do more uh, experimental things and more performative and uh, things. So I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, I don't know, now we are four years after and uh, we managed finally to have a voice uh, in Romania and the cultural Romanian scene. <laughs> Can you mention uh, some of the other topics that you're um, addressing in your plays? Would yeah, they are, I mean, they were considered to be really provocative for uh, also for the Roma community or for the Roma because we started to approach topics like Roma LGBT or um, speaking about uh, taboo topics like the sexuality of Roma women or hypersexualization of Roma women or um, uh, transgender Roma women or sex workers. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we approach a lot of provocative things and we think it's the time to speak about all these uh, topics. I mean, for example, when we, when we launch Gajo Dildo, you get it what means a Gajo, yeah? <laughs> and Dildo for sure, you know. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> So it was it was like for the first time we had a lesbian Roma character and it was very interesting because the Roma LGBT people came to us and they said this is for first time when we when someone take us into consideration because as Roma we are rejected from the LGBT community and as gay or lesbians we are also rejected from Roma community so there is no space for us <laughs> yeah so, 
Yeah, this is what we are doing. I mean, a lot of, of course, we received a lot of criticism for approaching such provocative topics, but I think art should be radical and provocative, and I, I don't want to do something else. <laughs> You also mentioned, uh, you just mentioned uh, this in intersectional discourse uh, that informs your, uh, your work with the company. Um, and you, you often reference intersectional feminism as one of the theories that um, um, serve as inspiration for you. Could you please talk a bit about that? Yes, I mean, we, our activism grew up uh, all these years, and we started to have uh, to organize lectures. We were inspired by black feminism. We we read I don't know Angela Davis, Maya Angelou, <laughs> all that things because we wanted to create also a Roma feminism, and that we wanted to separate for the white feminists <laughs> and to adopt an intersectional feminism. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, all our plays uh, uh, are about uh, Roma women and they have an intersectional approach. All right, uh, since we're quickly running out of time, uh, a brief question for uh, George and Petra. How was your encounter with uh, Mihaela's play? How did you um, approach the play and the text, the, the soundscapes uh, for Petra? Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to say it was it was eye-opening for me. The, the material was eye-opening because um, I'm also Romani. I'm from the Czech Republic, and um, our you know tradition is such a funny word. There's such a multitude of Romani traditions, and I think again, you know, um, it's hard for people to understand. Uh, we are as diverse as, for example, Jewish people. So if you imagine all the different cultures that come under the word Jewish, you know that that's how it is. And so we don't have um, the same kind of communities in the Czech Republic that Mikhail's play is talking about. So to me, it was like, okay, you know, trying to find the parallels within my own family, for example, and, and there are some parallels, um, and certainly, you know, the idea of, well, why should I attain a certain level of schooling? Now, for us, it's, you know, we're not talking going um, to eighth grade, that's, that's a given, right? But maybe why should I go um, get a certain diploma or, or go to college and and really throughout Europe um, the issue is the, it's so hard for Romani people to find work that it's really hard to motivate whether it's a, a girl or a boy um, to motivate people to stick with it through all the discrimination that happens in school um, so you know so it was just a lot of food for thought um, for me and in terms of uh, the soundscape um, I was actually, it was a collaborative effort, and so we kept a couple of the songs that Mihaela's had there um, in the past. Um, one of the, the songs, the, the one that came after, um, sort of the, the funeral song after the death of the husband, I actually took a song that I had, that existed, that I had already written lyrics to previously, and I changed them to, I mean, I know none of you understood this, but, but they were actually very fitting. Tell them um, the name. To, huh? Tell them the name of the song. The, so Choro Choro is, you know, the, the poor one, and so it, it was a war protest song, but now I was talking about, you know, um, dying and sort of the, um, you know, he, he went away from his wife and from his mother by dying. Um, so, you know, um, and then the, the wedding song was an actual wedding song, um, and again, you know, I, I thought really what would be fitting, and it's a song that's about a wedding, but it talks about honor, and it talks about sort of this idea of suffocation, and it talks about a girl, um, so then maybe you heard that at the end of that kind of very peppy wedding song, it got very somber. So I was trying to convey, even though people don't understand Romani, I was trying to convey that there are these uh, complexities to you know, these, these cultural phenomena. Um, what I found, um, I was worried when she sent me the play because um, in America, like um, she was saying that we're like hidden, like there's not a lot. And, and um, an American audience is not ignorant to the Roma situation, they're just unaware. They don't, they don't know, they don't know about all these things. And I was reading the play and I was um, translating into English and I would, my, my big thing was, you know, I would tell her, I would say, you know, you have to pause because they've never heard this for the first time, you know girls getting married at 13. And to me, it was very normal. I grew up in a Roma family, very traditional in America, third generation American, and we still do all that. I, I related to every one of her characters. 
Every one of her characters seemed normal to me. It was like normal growing up, every one, every single one. Because even in America, that goes on. It's actually very interesting, Diana, because you know, American laws protected our people because much like the Pennsylvania Deutsch, when we came over, we, we kept all of the traditions and we were allowed to because of American law. And you know, America's a melting pot. But as far as the play is going, was, this was very powerful and I had to switch things and, and, and have her say it differently so, they can, so you guys can take it in. Because like I said, you're, they're, not, they're unaware of such powerful topics as is she, she did it in Berlin and, and, and um, you know, Budapest and all these places, they know about Roma people and it's a different delivery because a lot of Europeans, as we know, they don't, they're racist towards Roma people so her delivery is different, you know? So that's, that was challenging for me a bit but I'm glad you liked it. I was so worried when I was sending it over to her back in Europe, I'm like, all right, here's this piece, here's this piece and she goes, no, George, continue, I love it, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, really, I really love it because he made it really local, especially at the first story, all these things with Nancy Reagan, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Well, yeah, I had to fit in, I, and I wasn't worried because I knew this was a New York audience, so, um, but it is very challenging. I just want to tell the audience that a lot of my family won't come to see the play because of the topics. And not because, I mean, they'll see her, they, she's not forbidden from the family or anything like that. It's just, it, it's not, the, the provocative topics are not spoke about amongst each other, you know? And it's not a, it, it is progressing here in America. It's not a feminine thing and it's not a masculine thing or anything like that. It's just an embarrassing thing. That's what it's turned into like, oh no, that's embarrassing, you can't say it in front. Like what she just said about her second play, I don't know if you noticed, I turned to her and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad my daughter-in-laws are not here. <laughs> but yeah. Well, thank you for, for this amazing effort of directing and performing Mihaela and uh, um, playing beautiful music. Uh, maybe we can take one question from the audience. Um, the lucky one, yes. <laughs> Yeah, or comments, thoughts on uh, on the play. Yes. Um, a, uh, given the stories you were telling, uh, could you just say a little bit about some of the the factual matter of background? How frequent or not frequent are Roma and Gaiju uh, marriages? And in general, how do more traditional uh, Roma communities treat Roma who, who marry someone uh, not Roma? Well, we were just talking about that. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, she did. Yeah, uh, in America or in Europe? No, in Europe. In Europe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I know the answer is yeah. going to be different for every group and every country group. and uh, every how, how collective. Is it looked upon? Ah, uh, I come from intermixed uh, marriage, and um, can can I reproduce my my monologue from Romarmi when I'm speaking about my intermarriage family? It's like this, uh, but maybe it's an exception. <laughs> it's like I have to speak to you about my about the intermixed marriage between my Gajo father and my Roma mother. My Gajo father loved her so much. Very rarely he called her a dirty gypsy. <laughs> and he beat her up only when she really deserved it. <laughs> that sounds very familiar. Um, actually, here in America, um, it's, not, it's not frowned, it's, it's frowned upon because it's, a, it's about preservation of the culture and not, you know, we don't, I don't know how anybody else, it's not about racism, it's about preservation of the culture. And, and we mentioned, uh, it's much like the Jewish people, Petra mentioned, it's like when they're before Israel, when you know, the Jewish mom would want to you know, marry a nice Jewish girl, don't do that, it's a survival instinct. But when it does happen, it happened a lot in my family, we just want the gajo person to convert, or you know, <laughs> then, <laughs> or you know, then, <laughs> <laughs> it's true though, it's like, yeah, be convert. And, and when they don't want to convert, let's say they're Italian, they will say like, well, why don't you want to convert? Well, you know, I want to preserve. Well, don't worry, the, you know, the, the government of Italy is, pre pre you know, uh, preserving your, your community. We don't have that. So convert to Romani, that's what we would say. <laughs> so. Uh, all right, maybe we'll end on this uh, note. <laughs> uh, thank you all again for, for joining us tonight, and let's give another round of applause for Mihaela and George.
and Pedro. And, and thank you for thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you, George and Petra and Diana for everything that you did these days. Thank you. you know I love you. Excuse me. Um, hi, everyone. Can we just clear the space so we can set up for the play that's starting at 8 p.m.?